Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Terre Haute. This congregation welcomes all people, regardless of their age, religion, race, nationality, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or anything else that has been used to divide people. We are a group of people with our own opinions, our own ideas, our own dreams, but we share ideals. We share a common belief in a liberal religion. In our discussions, we may disagree with each other, but we must always remember that what unites us is stronger than what separates us. We must always end the service aware of the love that we have for each other. This is usually the time when we go over um, each one of our principles, but today we have a video on being you, you. It's called We Are You, Yous. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people of many paths who are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. Every day, people are inundated with information, overwhelmed by demands, and pulled by a culture that seeks to divide us from the web of life. Unitarian Universalism reconnects, bringing people together with meaning and inspiration. We are a house without walls, a congregation without spiritual limits, and a movement that calls you to put more faith in yourself, your community, and your beliefs. We are a faith that honors your mind, your heart, your journey. Simply put, we are a guided path towards a better you and a better world. Grounded in hundreds of years of thoughtful religious communities, we are people of many generations, ethnicities, genders and sexualities, and spiritual backgrounds. People engaged in making the world a better place. People focusing on what really matters, love, justice, integrity, and hope. Unitarian Universalists have different beliefs, but shared values. We are Unitarian Universalists, and at the same time, we may also be agnostic, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, humanist, Jewish, Muslim, pagan, atheist, believers in God, and those who let the great mystery be. The diversity of beliefs you'll find in a Unitarian Universalist community is one of our strengths. We're always learning how to see the world from a different perspective. What unites us are our core principles that uphold seven real-world values, believing in the worthiness of every person, showing compassion and fairness, accepting others for who they are, growing through a personal search for truth, leading with democratic spirit, working for justice, and understanding that everything is interconnected. Seven days a week, Unitarian Universalists live these principles by doing. When we gather, we worship, reflect, and remind ourselves what matters most in life. Whatever our age, we learn to live with more wisdom, more awareness, more gratitude, and more soul. We show our values by showing up to answer the call for social justice. We have a track record of standing on the side of love for civil rights, LGBTQ equality, immigration reform, environmental sustainability, reproductive justice, racial justice, and more. Find what it means to live your deepest values out loud. 
Join us on this extraordinary adventure of faith. These opening words are in your order of service. Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. Rumi. Opening hymn number 38. Transitional words are again in our order of service. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are an entire ocean in a drop. Rumi. I am here with uh, John Lunsford, today's speaker. And I love it because I think it's going to be a good time. He always has great topics. And he delivers it in such a way that it's so enjoyable. So our own John Lunsford is going to talk today. You guys are in for a real treat, honestly. Um, it's called Reflections on the Last 70 Years. His interesting perspective on life in general and specifically will fascinate us all. Eric. Um, he is currently the chair of our board for a few months more at least. Um, and he has been a great leader, and we look forward to this. Well, I never have wrote a book, or, or um, uh, but I've read a few, and I always read Dorothy Jerse's book. I keep it on the, and I look, you know, you think, well, what's happened today? And of course, with my memory, it's new every time you read it. But I happened to look up on my birthday. Two things happened in Terre Haute. In 1853, a tornado hit. <laughs> and uh, on the same day, in 1853, the floating palace arrived at the Ohio Street dock. And of course, the circus came to town. That's what it was. <laughs> I thought that was appropriate. Um, uh, I like it. It's get you a copy of it. The other thing I have, I noticed that uh, when you turn 70, most of my birthday cards involved underwear and fat animals in their underwear <laughs> eating pizza. Uh, thought that was kind of cute. So here I am today. I guess the planets lined up. Julie was short of speaker and I turned 70. Usually I talk about racism or lynching or what's wrong with America. Today I thought we'd just talk about the differences between growing up under, say, uh, uh, Truman or maybe George Bush or Bill Clinton. On 
April 22nd, 1951, it was a rather gray, chilly spring evening, and it was snowing. And my father loaded up my 17-year-old mother and drove her to the Vermilion County Hospital. The next morning, at 7-11, I was born. It was the year of the rabbit. I learned that from uh, the placemats at the Panda Garden. <laughs> uh, uh, according to my mother, it was a very hard birth. I don't know what she was complaining about. It took me two years to learn to walk. Um, for the last few months, my dad had been building our house. It was a three-room house on the Vigo Park County line, and it set about halfway up on a huge hill. In fact, you could look out the kitchen window down onto the roof of the school bus. It was that, we were that far up. Uh, meanwhile, we lived in Rosedale at my great-grandmother's house until Dad finished the house. Uh, of course, he never finished it, really. Um, uh, it had a living room, a kitchen, and a bedroom. Uh, heat came from a warm morning stove in the kitchen and uh, the fireplace in the living room. Uh, the bathroom was uh, 60 foot out back, uh, but by today's standards, probably pretty primitive, but uh, we were the first members of our family to ever own a new home. Three years later, when my sister was born, dad added on to the house, and then we got an indoor bathroom and another bedroom for me and my sister to share, along with a propane furnace. Three years after that, when Mike was born, we got one more bedroom, a proper modern house. Uh, I did continue to use the outhouse. It was the only place, you know, when you had three kids in one bathroom, it was the only place you'd get a piece and nobody else wanted to out there. But we had everything, uh, running water, heat, electricity, two TV channels, and a general telephone party line that we shared with only eight other families. As kids, we had a level of freedom that today you kids can only dream of. You were told to leave the house as soon as you finished eating your breakfast, go do your chores, and then you could just run completely amok until lunch. Uh, then you could return to whatever chaos you'd started in the morning after you stopped for your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We built tree houses and cabins. We dug caves and tunnels in the hillside that would made any Viet Cong proud. We rode bicycles without helmets, uh, traveled in the back of pickup trucks, turned grapevines into swings, and we camped six nights a week in the woods only to come home on Saturday night to take a bath, watch Walt Disney, and go to church on Sunday morning. My Roger, Roger my cousin, and I, we reenacted all of the World War II battles, first with dirt clods and later on with BB guns. Uh, contrary to our, what our mom said, uh, we still both have eyes. Uh, my grandfather had three large gardens and we raised watermelons and sweet corn and tomatoes that we sold down at the road. In the fall, we spent all of our free time scouring the hills for ginseng and golden seal and collected persimmons and black walnuts. So what does a childhood straight out of an episode of the Waltons get you? Well, outside of maybe an appreciation for where your food comes from and what it takes to produce it, probably not too much, it does give you a lot of cool stories for cool winter evenings, entertaining your friends with tales of your rustic upbringing. Perhaps the valuable thing was a sense of self-sufficiency and the ability to tackle projects that you had no clue how to do. Uh, it was a strange time to live in America with Indiana's blue laws 
it was still illegal to buy a pair of pants on Sunday. And according to Senator McCarthy, there were communists hiding under every bush in your front yard. Now, I've been told that with the proliferation of cell phones and digital cameras that many of you guys have, people under the age of, say, 45 have been quite fond of taking nude photographs of themselves and sending them to friends and potential lovers. When you're my age, the only way you could have had a nude photo of yourself is if you were lucky enough to have a relative wealthy enough to buy a Polaroid land camera, it was about that big, or you knew some underworld pervert that lived with a dark room in his basement uh, and he got his kicks developing pictures. And then you could have kept that black and white photograph in a Prince Albert can under the floorboards in the attic and no one would ever know. I don't think digital photographs are going to go away. I think they'll just exist somewhere in the cloud. And if Andy Warhol was right and you guys get your 15 minutes of fame, I'm sure you'll have fun explaining those pictures to your kids 20 years from now. Uh, I thought me and Spencer always talk movies. If they made a movie out of my life, it would be probably directed by John Waters. It would have a budget of about 300 bucks with half the money allocated for Popeye's chicken and Diet Cokes. Uh, he'd probably have Divine play me, but not in drag, just blue jeans and a t-shirt. And if you don't know those names, talk to me, we'll have a movie night. Um, when we were encouraged to leave the Assemblies of God Church for buying a television set, it cost about as much as a car. It was about the size of a chest freezer, not the screen, that was only about the size of a dinner plate. And when mom would turn on the Philco Radiation King, it took about 10 minutes to warm up and then it made that crackling sound, you know? And, and the hair would stand up on the back of your head. So you got your, and then of course you set four foot in front of it. And you, you, no wonder, we should, we should glow. Um, your reception, TV reception, was governed by your supply of aluminum foil and how long your sister could stand still holding one arm of the rabbit ears. It didn't make any difference whether you were watching Paladin or Sergeant Bilko. It was always snowing. Ricky and Lucy slept in separate beds. And strangely, every week, your mom made a pilgrimage to the IGA to get a copy of an entire magazine dedicated to telling you what was on the three channels that you could get. It had crossword puzzles, recipes, and all the Hollywood gossip, usually about how straight Rock Hudson was. <laughs> One of my st strangest memories was going to Dr. Monticello in Clinton, and while he examined you, he smoked a cigarette and, and drank one of those little bottles of Coke. Everybody smoked. Even the doctors would get on the television and told you that if you would smoke menthol Newports, it would clear up your smoker's cough. So are there any secrets to getting to 70? Well, not in my case. Outside of, I think, sheer dumb luck and not walking on railroad tracks, I don't have a clue how I got to this milestone that really has eluded a lot of members of my family. I do have advice for what few younger people we have, and that would be always to graduate high school, don't smoke, don't get married before you're 21, or become a single parent and save 10 cents out of every dollar you get. Get a job and try to increase your wage every time you take a new job. And keep a record of your accomplishments. Never fear your resume. And speaking of resumes, if you've ever sneezed and farted at the same time, update your resume to include experience in multitasking. If you're early in your career, 
Don't be afraid of tapping the resources that exist in this very room. Where am I at? <laughs> Buy a fountain pen and learn the art of writing letters. After you drop your precious iPhone in the toilet, all your texts and pictures will disappear into the city sewage system, but letters will still exist. The week I wrote this, I had, was going through some papers and I found the letter that my great uncle Bob wrote to his mother, my great grandmother Clara. He had received leave and so he could visit his brother Albert before Christmas. That letter reached his mother after she had been informed that Albert had been killed two days later at the Battle of the Bulge and would be buried in a massive U.S. cemetery in Epinal, France. Teach yourself to stay busy. You'll, you'll be surprised how much you will accomplish and you'll find it easier to stay in a better frame of mind and I think you get less susceptible to depression and self-image issues. And basically the pursuit of things. Finally, if you can, realize that being truly happy is a choice. It's not a consequence of places or things. Don't fall into the trap a belief that all of my problems will disappear if I just move to the beach or to the mountains. Whatever vexes you here will mysteriously follow you wherever you go. The person responsible for most of my problems looks me in the eye every morning in the mirror. Try to learn to be helpful, useful to other people Others will love you for it, and you can learn to love yourself. Invite somebody over for supper. Teach yourself how to cook for yourselves and others. My tip is learn how to make banana pudding and find somebody to share it with. Develop a passion for a cause, for your church, or a craft. And don't get addicted to your electrical devices Computers and phones are wonderful, but learn to put your phone away and carry on a conversation with someone. No one will have cherished text messages. But many cherished memories can be made sitting around a campfire, acting stupid with some of your friends, or skinny dipping in the creek. Learn to read a map, change a tire, do a magic trick or recite a poem from memory. And for God's sakes, develop a sense of humor about yourself. If you're going to shed tears in this life, let them be tears of laughter. Also, think about the fact that there's a stairway to heaven, but a highway to hell. That says a lot about anticipated traffic numbers. <laughs> and also remember, it's probably never a good idea to appear on Judge Judy. Now, I would like to stop for a second and say that I might have a difference of opinion on that. I watched a little documentary on Judge Judy, and as long as you don't mind being called a liar, liar, pants on fire, and you're an idiot or a moron. You don't have to pay, even if you lose. They pay everybody on that show. Even the people that sit in the audience and gasp, uh, they all get paid. So if, if you've got good self-esteem, they'll pay your bill. I also, just to close, wanted to say how much I admire so many, many of our members who have like they, the commercial, aged like fine wine. I kind of aged more like milk. I got sour and chunky. 
Uh, so how much of this advice is valuable? Probably not much. It was free. But live today like there's no tomorrow, because nothing is guaranteed. And remember, we do, for the first Sunday, we have coffee and snacks. Thank you. Our closing hymn is number 128, For All That Is Our Life. Closing words are in your order of service. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Rumi. Peace, know that you are loved and that your life is sacred.